All right, our AV people are all situated and sat down. So thank you all very much for coming to this last session on our second day of OpenStack Summit. We're gonna be talking um, to some really amazing people about um, your OpenStack DevOps, DevOps team. Um, and really just, it's really going to be a conversation that we'll start with our panel and some prepared questions um, about what it is to have a development and or an operations team that works in the OpenStack community when you are part of an actual company. So here is our moderator and panelists. I am Rania Mosier. I am a software development manager in the deploy and release section at Rackspace Hosting. I have been known to burst into Broadway show tunes whenever a lyric popped into my head. So if I hear Q, I might start singing. Um, and I like to call myself an innovation evangelist. Um, just started coming up, that, coming up with that idea, like how do you go faster, better, more. Um, next to me here is actually Mike Wilson, the scaling master at Mirantis, also known as a systems architect. And he plans on going to, the, to Mars Colony one day. Next to him is Topher White, the ops guy from HP. And I was very interested to know that in some circles, not only is he a very snazzy dresser, but in some circles, he is better known for his catering than his technology. Um, and he's actually officially the architect of the public cloud operations and infrastructure at Hewlett Packard. And then next to him is Amy Trong. She is the chief cat herder of Rackspace, also known as the dev manager for cloud databases. So she works extensively with Trove. Uh, she was on a TV show, so ask her and she'll tell you what it was. And um, on the end is Jesse Keating, the chief automator at Rackspace, um, also known as the senior engineer, and wrote a script to automate his entire job for a week while he was in a training class. <laughs> he also works remote on my team, so now I'm like, hmm. <laughs> so um, I'll leave these up during the course of the presentation, so if you want to jot down people's names and their contact information, um, save a tree from a business card, that would be great. Um, just to kind of set the tone and the context of where we are, I've been involved in OpenStack for two years as the SDLC manager for Rackspace before I got into the development management pro project. I've worked with Nova, Glance, some with Neutron, as well as OpenStack infrastructure. Um, Mike here has worked with um, OpenStack, Nova, Oslo, and Neutron, and in the past has contributor to, contributed as a developer to the Linux kernel, as well as some, um, may they rest in peace, small, dead, open source projects. We all kind of have those in our history, I believe. Um, Topher was reticent on what his OpenStack history or open source history was, but he has watched HP go through the evolution of using OpenStack um, from kind of we're gonna do our own thing all the way to their very highly participatory attitude that they take now. Um, and so has some great, great lessons and stories to share from that. Amy um, really was part of the team that grew the Red Dwarf project, which was the original OpenStack database service concept into Trove, which is now a community um, in and of itself. And so she's, she's had some great experience there. And then finally, Jesse is, um, works in OpenStack infra team as well. Um, is a heavy contributor to the Ansible project, which we use for orchestration, and um, also was on the Fedora project for many years in release engineering and the Anaconda uh, service. So we have some good open source experience up here, and that's really what we're gonna talk about. So to set the context beyond the OpenStack involvement or the open source involvement, um, I'd like to ask each of our panelists, starting with Mike, what development and operations look like within your teams, within your company? Sure. Um, so the places I've, I've, I've been at and, and involved in OpenStack, uh, DevOps to me means that we have a team that is responsible for uh, the development of the products, new features, and they're also very, they're concerned about the operational problems. They're not divorced from that. They're not able to hand that off. That's also their responsibility. I think naturally you have, you still have people on that DevOps team that are more opsy or more devy. Um, the key thing to me is, is really the shared responsibility and uh, kind of the team goal of making, you know, ops the end all of, you know, it has to work. It can't be a, con uh, a concept that is pretty in a, in a software engineer's mind. But. 
Uh, it's been interesting watching HP uh, evolve over the last couple of years. And when I started there two years ago, it was um, a very, very strong culture of uh, the development and the operations of a particular service were uh, together reporting to the same manager. Um, and the last few months, they've made a significant pivot, uh, culminating in the release of our new Helion uh, product, um, in which they really wanted to consolidate the development environment, the developers, to be oriented toward producing uh, kind of shrink wrap software and take that approach. And for public cloud operations, we are to be one of the premier receivers of that and operating that. So we've made this pivot to say that uh, operations is going to be an organization that runs shrink wrap software that is produced out of a development organization. And that has uh, left us with some graps, graps, <laughs> gaps that we're grappling with right now um, to uh, figure out how we fill in um, some of those pieces. Little spackle. Little spackle. Little spackle. Maybe a lot of spackle. So I'm going to answer the question a little bit differently. Um, so the question is, um, how does development operations look like in our team. And so uh, so I'm the software development manager for cloud databases at Rackspace. And um, while I have a team of developers, we work very closely with our operations team. So it's actually two different teams, but it's in the same organization. And I don't think it really, for me, I don't, it, doesn't really matter as much like which team it's on as long as we're actively like working together. So our daily stand-ups, we're um, talking with them every day. We're constantly interacting with them on IRC. So um, really like just, I guess I'm not really um, answering the question like how I define it, but just more of like how we do it. And I just think it's just important that we're always, um, you know, we work together as one team, whether you're reporting to a different manager or not. So much like uh, Mike and Amy, uh, our group, uh, we approach development and operations in DevOps not as like a position, but as a culture. And our, while our developers do focus a lot on developing upstream and, and writing their code upstream, and that's kind of their day job, they also have a role in how that software gets deployed and configured out in our production environment. And they are typically the ones that write the configuration stuff and, and write that. And we go even a step beyond that in as we go to do deployments, we often use a hot seat approach and we take a developer from one project or another, but we have them sit there and actually hit the buttons that make the code go from one point to another. You know, with, with a lot of support behind them of, of people telling them what's going on and why it's doing this, but it helps grow that knowledge and grow that understanding of what's going on in the operational side of what their software is doing. And that just brings everybody to the table with an expressed interest of making it perfect from, or at least good, from, uh, from <laughs> the very beginning to the very end. Thank you. I would like to also add that those developers that get in the hot seat, they volunteer. We don't just like pick somebody at random and say, you have no operational experience, and you're now, you're now part of that. That's so nice. It really is. It really is. Um, and we have a waiting list, actually, <laughs> to go do it. So one of the reasons when I, when I proposed this panel, and, and you know, when we've talked and, and just got, gotten to know each other, a lot of people just met each other yesterday for the first time, was to actually bring together a few companies that are doing this open source development and open source operations to, to, to actually talk about. And so we have, we have three, of the, of three great companies, three great examples, Mirantis, Hewlett Packard, and, um, and Rackspace. And so, as we set the context, and we're going to spend the next couple of minutes, the next couple of questions, really talking about engagement and how we engage with the OpenStack community within your teams or within your organization. Um, and so this question, and let's, let's start um, with Topher, actually. Um, what are some of the ways your team's OpenStack participation manifests itself? Again, um, this is gone through uh, some transition for us. And I think um, it's been really uh, interesting to watch 
HP and specifically from public cloud operations. As operations folks, we're kind of on the end, on the receiving side. And the thought about what does contributing and participating in open source mean was really a very little consideration uh, to us. Um, and there's been some things that have come along that have uh, been big, bright, uh, flashing signs that said, wait a minute, this is going to have a lot more impact on us than uh, the, the code change in Nova that I really don't care about. Um, and, and what's going on with Triple O and Ironic were real highlights uh, for us to say, wow, this is something where this is going to have huge impacts on how we do our jobs. We're going to need to participate. So we've gone through um, an uh, a growth period where we started out, let's go uh, 14 months, a year and a half ago, um, looking at feeding stories into our development organization and saying, hey guys, here's things you need to think about. Uh, here's what really happens in a data center that you need to anticipate. Um, through several iterations to the point now where um, we've got uh, Teams, we have one uh, team in our operations organization that is primarily developing tools for us and are looking at how do we drive those into OpenStack and let our voices be known there. Um, and even then into individual operations folks who, you know, the great thing about operations folks is they're always writing tools, they're doing little automation pieces and saying, hey, wait a minute, if you're going to solve that, Let's start thinking about how we solve that in the community um, together. And so what was once something that was very much at arm's length um, and saying, you know, just deliver us software, we'll run it, that's fine, has now become something that we really realize the importance of participating in and we're driving it, that idea of participation down through our entire organization. Awesome. Miss Amy. So um, the project that my team is focused on is Trove, and Trove is um, actually a relatively new project in the whole OpenStack community. Um, so just a few years ago, it was just a handful of rackers, and an HP joined, and um, we've grown the community to um, now um, over 15 companies, um, over 50 contributors to the Icehouse release. Um, and uh, so now what we do, what our, I guess our day-to-day -day, um, is like is, so in my team, we have one PTL. Uh, so, well, actually, one former PTL. So Michael Basnight was the Trove PTL, and he's handed that, uh, uh, that off to um, Nikhil uh, from, um, from HP. And um, so we have an, a PTL who's focused full-time on Trove, and that's something I want to highlight, too. So if you have... If you're working with an OpenStack team and you just, everyone needs to be aware that it is a, it's, a, it's an investment. Um, so there's a lot of requirements, a lot of expectations from the community and so you need to make sure that you have the support from um, your executive teams, from your company, um, to make sure that your team can be successful to you know, focus on um, the community priorities. So, um, so my team, we have uh, uh, one former Trove PTL, um, uh, uh, two, two core, in addition to that, two core contributors, so three total with the uh, former PTL. Um, my team, uh, we meet uh, weekly. Uh, we have a, a weekly Trove meeting, and something I just wanted to share is like, if you're thinking about um, um, contributing to the community, what's helpful for us is we do an internal uh, sync up uh, prior to our meeting. Um, the purpose of this is to prioritize and just to make sure like we're on the same page like the type of things that we want to bring up So if you guys have been in RC meetings, you know that it can get kind of a little um, busy so um, We find that that's been helpful and uh, we actually use TeamSpeak. So I'm getting into some of the the mechanics of how we do this But hopefully this can be helpful for you for you guys but we um, we actually use TeamSpeak and if you guys have never used TeamSpeak before it's like a lot of gamers use this is like voice over IP um, and so we're on, um, this helps us kind of align, um, we kind of, this helps our rackers. Uh, we have 10 rackers who are contributing to Trove. 
kind of on here just like kind of chatting about like, well, here are the things that, you know, I want to bring up and um, it gives us an opportunity to ask like questions beforehand um, so that you can spend the hour with the, cor the, the Trove community with like some um, other important questions. And the other thing that we do is we kind of hang out and we kind of stay on TeamSpeak while the, um, the public um, meeting goes on in IRC and that's an opportunity for people to um, kind of talk among with each other just to make, just to kind of like get people like feel more comfortable because sometimes, especially for newcomers, um, we have um, people who aren't really sure like is this the type of question I want to bring up or maybe another teammate already has an answer so I can just ask him or her real quick and then I can focus, and we can focus the, uh, the, the, the public meeting on something else. So anyway, just wanted to share that. Um, also, the other thing is um, how um, our team um, participates in OpenStack is we actually, so we had a Trove mid-cycle meetup. Um, so for Ice House, that has become a really popular thing, um, especially as the OpenStack summits have gotten really large and the scope has gotten a lot broader. Um, the mid-cycle meetups allow each uh, project to focus on its, you know, specific um, topics. So um, we had one in Austin. Um, this spring, it was for three days. Um, Rackspace sponsored this. Um, we had um, four different companies come out. There were like 30 participants. Um, so it was really an awesome thing. So, um, and I know that other other projects have been doing this as well. Like um, uh, I know uh, Nova, Glance, Neutron, they've done um, mid-cycle meetups. So anyway, so just that's what the stuff that we've, we've done. Excellent, thank you. Um, so Mr. Jesse, I actually wanna switch gears a little bit. And so we've heard some of how the, how the participation manifests itself in, in an operations environment and in a dev environment. Um, I would like to hear from you and Mike on what are the frustrations that you've had to deal with? Um, so from, from our team's aspect, we're not really OpenStack developers. We're not in Nova, we're not in Glance, but we're, we're users of these and, and pretty significant users of these. But it, it can be hard as somebody from the outside of, the, of that specific development community to come in and say, hey, look, we've got this big problem that we're facing as a user, can you help us figure this out? And a lot of times the, the initial response is, we'll throw some code at us and we'll review it. And that's, that's great, I mean, that's something we could do, but what we're also looking for is more of a collaboration type thing. And so trying to bring that, our, our wants and desires not as just as something we're throwing over the wall and saying, hey, you need to do this, but as a way of creating a collaborative session. That can be pretty difficult, uh, particularly for somebody who's new to how the OpenStack upstream ecosystem works, just getting in, getting all their things together so that they can actually do a submission if they have code, and just finding the right people to talk to to get that to happen. Um, that's, that's one of the yeah, issues. Thank you. How can you expand on that? Sure. I mean, um, I, have, I, have, I think I'm going to follow some of the, the same things that Jesse talked about. Um, when I initially got involved in the OpenStack community two years ago, um, I didn't know any Python. I really didn't have any cloud background uh, other than like... Ditto. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> yeah, other than some random experience with whatever, some consulting experience. So... <laughs> Um, getting introduced to the community was, was confusing. There's a lot of information out there. And, and, and like Jesse was saying, a lot of people are going to say, well, submit some code. And that's how you can help. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, there is a lot of ways that you can contribute um, to, to the community. I, I think one of those ways that's maybe less accessible is coming to the summits and participating in the discussions here and pulling aside you know, key people in the community. Um, letting them know about your use case, you know, participating in the user committee, um, letting them know about your pain, your troubles. Uh, some more accessible online ways to do this is reporting bugs, reviewing bugs. Uh, there's a neat little thing that you can do that people actually pay attention to. You can go report a bug, and if someone else has reported, or if someone else encounters the same bug, they can go find your bug and they can say, yeah, this bug affects me too. And it kind of raises the heat level of the bug. And when the types of people who go through and review bugs and prioritize them see that, they're going to take that into account. Um, so another, another thing that I would encourage is um, really uh, when we talk about the non-code aspects of the community, 
you, you really need to talk. You really need to be vocal. Um, you need to get out of your comfort zone a little bit. You need to do weird things like contact people over email and invite them to a, a Google Hangout and say, I want to talk about this problem because I don't know where I can help, but I have a problem. And I, I want to talk about it with someone who can, who can help me get this into OpenStack. So, I mean, these are, these are really the ways that, that I feel more involved in the community. I'm not like some awesome coder. I feel like I'm just a guy with some use case experience and I've been able to share that a little bit and I, I feel like that's had a positive impact. And not only that, but I, I like doing that. So. Excellent. Um, I wanted to open it up to the floor and see if there are any questions from anyone right now. I see someone walking up. If you could just come up to the mic and if you'd like to ask a question. We're going we're gonna to do an exercise in getting out of your comfort zone and talking, so you will have to use the mic. Okay, this, this question is more DevOps in general, not necessarily the open source, OpenStack or anything related, but we're looking at moving from a shrink wrap software model that we sell to providing a service that's hosted in our own private cloud. And when we talk about DevOps and we're trying to figure it out, what's the granularity of these changes that you push in on a daily or hourly or weekly basis? How do you figure out what that chunk of code is that somebody's fixed a bug, does that mean I replace the entire web app or the entire native app? or? Do I know, do you know that if you build a, an RPM that contains that piece of code, that that RPM can install and you don't need to restart any services or reboot the application? Or how do you kind of just go about in general dealing with that? So um, one of the, the interesting things when you talk about granularity is that the amount of balancing the volume of change with how long it takes to propagate that change out. So um, there are certain classes of changes that we have in, in our environment that I know it takes me a minimum of three weeks to roll that across everything that it needs to be rolled across done in a safe way. I do not want to do that with every check-in, <laughs> right? right. So, so you have to start to get some grip around how long does it take me to roll out? How much time do I want to spend deploying? What does it take to deploy safely? And then that starts to give you some guidance about how, how big and, and how do I want to manage these chunks. You will find that that is not one answer. There are certain services that I can roll out in three or four hours. And I'm OK doing those more frequently. The general feeling. Um, that I've gotten in working with both operators and developers in this space is more frequently is better because then the amount of things you're changing are better. The ability to isolate whether or not a particular change broke something is better. But you can't kill yourself rolling out small changes if it takes a very, very long time. So you gotta find balance is what I found is that what's, how, what, what's the effort to deploy it versus how often do I want to do that? Um, I have rolled, I kind of fall on the, the three to one. So if it takes me three weeks to deploy something, then I don't want to do that any more than once every nine weeks. If it takes me a few hours, I can, I can do that much more frequently. But you got to find that balance point in how much effort it is. I would add to that as well that another factor you want to bring into this is what is the impact on your consumers for those changes? And, and again, there's going to be different types of changes, but you have to look at the impact of, of each particular type of change and then measure how frequently you can have that impact upon your consumers. If there's no impact, then you know, do it as frequently as you can because, that, again, that brings your change that you're making into so small that it's easy to isolate any type of issues. But if your change is going to have an impact on your customer and your, your application uptime, then that's really something you have to reflect upon and figure out how frequently you want to inflict that. Um, and that will drive how frequently you do your changes. Yeah, I would even add to that. We kind of had, a, we kind of had an agreement with our customers how often we could take things down and be super disruptive. And uh, yeah, I, I feel like it was pretty successful. We had a model where we would deploy uh, smaller changes 
hope we would try to do that weekly. And then the game breaking changes, uh, we had a cycle where once a month uh, we would kind of roll those out and everybody was expecting it and planning on it. So. Does, that, does that help there? Yeah, and Tover, you mentioned that you were kind of moving back and pivoting towards a shrink wrap model and a release model to where the developers hand that off to the ops folks. Is that, can, can you elaborate a little more on that and what drove you to, to make that change? Well, what drove HP to make that change is um, they looked at, uh, they actually had a number of different OpenStack projects going on. Public cloud was one, and that's the side that, that, uh, that I represent. And we had developers producing uh, code that was very specific to public cloud and doing a lot of patching and some things were moving up. But they had lots of other projects going on. They took a look at that. Um, and the cool thing about HP is that they, they were able to say, we're going to have you know, multiple groups working even in the same space because we don't know how the space is going to evolve. We don't know yet what our customers are going to want. And after a period of time, they're able to stop and take a look at that and say, based on our, the experience in public cloud and while we learned some lessons there and our experience in this team over here and these conversations that we're having with our customers, now that we've gathered all this data, we think this is the right pivot for us in our market. And then what does that mean for how we're going to deliver to public cloud? So it was very much a product and marketing decision driven by experience for a particular segment. And, and we have a, a particular segment, Fortune 1000, that, that we're going for. And that's what was right for us. So we have next up here. Yeah. I have I have a couple of questions. So my first question is, I noticed that nobody talked about QA in your DevOps process. So how did you guys include the QA in your whole process? Question number one. And question number two is, the cloud technology is enabling the continuous deployment. And that's what we go and preach all our customers and community, everybody saying that organizations should go agile and then follow CD. And as leaders in this area, what is your vision and what is your take on the CD? Is it a successful model that can be practiced and shown to the world, or is it just theory and practically it is not going to work? So, so let me uh, just make sure we have it. The first part is the QA, is the, how, how, we're, how we're integrating QA. Yeah. Thank you for that, because we always forget to say it, and it's so important. Um, and then the second part is just the, the CD, the CD. continuous deployment yeah, model yes. that we're kind of preaching in the DevOps world yeah, in particular. Thanks or in the, in the development and operations, is that actually sustainable and, yeah, and do we see it as a, as a viable right. option? Right. What we see in the internet for the world is DevOps is for CD. DevOps is a means to achieve the CD. Yeah. So as leaders in this domain, what is our experience and what are the problems we are seeing? What should we go and tell the community and the world? Who wants to take the QA? I, I can take the QA one. Um, so I, I think QA is a really key part uh, of your DevOps process. Um, the only way that I've been able to make DevOps actually work, I, I, can't, I can't do what some of these other guys do. I can't actually get my developers, my operations guys in the same room and interested in the same problems. Um, but I can, I, I can put them at an agreement point, right? Which is that they both have to convince QA that this is going to work. So I, I think a, a really a core part of this uh, is some of the CI, CD stuff. Uh, but a code review process, a formalized code review process where... Uh, QA makes sure that someone from ops has signed off, they've given their okay, someone from dev has signed off, and they think it's legit. So really this, this, uh, this two check system between dev and ops never worked until we gave QA the final say. Um, so I'll let somebody else handle the other part. I'll add on to that. When we do a release, um, so we try to um, follow a Currently, we're trying to follow a 10-day cadence. So every 10 days, we cut a release base. And this is, this is the um, latest and greatest code. And we'll cut the release, test it. Um, but then on the day before we can release, we have a sign-off. And it's a sign-off between development, operations, and the QA team. So um, that three has to, we have to agree before we push that out. We see a lot of patterns in threes, and QA really is the third leg of the stool. If without it, the stool falls over, right? So continuous integration, continuous delivery also means continuous validation, and that's the only real way that you can get from, from 
something landed to something in production is by way of validation. So it's absolutely key. If, if I can talk about the uh, continuous integration um, question, I think that um, it was actually about continuous deployment, deployment. which yes. is a slightly different, we, different thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, but yeah. Okay. Well, then I'll talk about the continuous deployment question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the um, I, I think that uh, is it is it real? Uh, the question comes down to uh, at what scale and in what environment. Um, absolutely, is it real to be able to have something um, coming in, getting auto-validated, getting deployed out somewhere to, to some environment in a continuous way? Yes. Is that how you will deploy it out at scale in production? I think that's got a long way to go. And I'll tell you one of the reasons is we have seen some really fantastic bugs that do not manifest themselves <laughs> until you get to a certain size or a certain time. And um, that is something where we, we really believe in um, not only having good long bake times and bake times at scale, but when I said before, uh, when I talked about how long it takes to deploy something safely, um, that's about um, being able to segment deployments so that you limit your risk of an, uh, something that you did not detect in QA, you did not detect in bake, hitting your environment. And so that is something that, that we have felt that when you start getting to very significant scales, um, there's just really interesting bugs that emerge at that, at that level that you want to protect yourself from by being a little bit more slow, a little bit more deliberate. And we may have continuous deployment going into an environment all the time and at some point say, great, we're now going to take this thing that's all up to date and move it to another segment. Yeah, the, the fun part about continuous delivery is that continuous is never defined. You know, continuous can mean every single day. Continuous can mean every other week. Uh, but generally, continuous doesn't mean every six months. A lot of things, a lot of the, the strategies are you don't wait for a, a massive upstream major release. What you're doing is you're pulling fairly continuously. You're validating fairly continuously. And then you're deploying that bit as it makes sense in your organization. But you're not waiting for that for the big things to happen before you. So continuous can happen, it's just continuous at whatever pace continuous means Whatever for you. regularity. And, and, and so the English nerd inside of me really wants to say it's supposed to be continual, yeah. not <laughs> continuous. A caterer, snazzy dresser, and an English nerd. <laughs> I also want to add one more thing. Like you, you, for this to be continuous, you need a support from the rest of your your team, your your whole organization. So a lot of times, like I think it's really easy for people to want to say, "Oh wait, we need to hope the release because I need this one bug in or I need this one feature in." Well, how we look at it is like it's kind of like a train station. You miss a train, you know what? It's gonna there no, another train's coming up later. So, mm -hmm. so you shouldn't you shouldn't hold things back. You just need to keep going. Like, um, you know, but there are some checks and balances. Like I mentioned the. The, um, the sign off process that we have with dev ops and, and the QA team but you know we have to think about a bit like a you know a, a continuous like you know train station schedule as I you know just keep going so I think that kind of to summarize this particular segment was that QA is really the glue that holds the dev and the ops together and kind of gives them a place to come together and actually be successful and then that continuous whatever, is very much a real thing and it just very greatly depends on how you define that, how you use it, what is the right thing. So as customers come up um, and start using the cloud, start adopting the cloud and, and saying I'm going to create a pipeline where I can do continual delivery, I'm, you're going to ruin me forever now. Thank you so much Topher, <laughs> I will never be able to say this again. Um, um, it's really going to depend on, on what their use case is, where they are in their maturity level and how complicated their, their application is. Um, so yeah. I guess if I could just add something to that summary, one takeaway, you hear a lot of CI, CD um, talk around process. And really, I think we've talked more about culture um, than, than process. And I think that's where the model is awesome and is really going to make our lives better. Yeah. 
I saw a hand over here. So is it continuous integration, continuous? The buzzword is continuous integration and continuous deployment, CICD. Right. Correct English apparently is continual. On both of those? Yeah. On both of those, and that's just, that's just the English lesson for the day. <laughs> It means you don't stop. It doesn't okay. necessarily mean that you're doing it constantly. Okay, so when you implemented your uh, continual delivery uh, transition we're or gonna demo, change, like we're going to like uh, have a whole new movement come out of this no, one session. I, I just add one question, which is, uh, did you actually shift away the responsibility of the uptime of your environment away from the ops group to the development units, or how is that transition? Because in our experience, one of the biggest, uh, let's say, impediments into the DevOps transition is ops group incentivized to keep the uptime as, uh, as high as possible and therefore being very uh, resistant to transitioning that responsibility to towards the development units. So I can take this one. Um, what, what's been successful for us has been to try and align the, the teams so that your ops team and your devs team all are all reporting up the same ladder eventually so that they're as a whole judged on the product itself, not whether ops stayed up for a certain amount number of days before there was an outage or whether certain features got in, but as a whole, they're all judged together. And when they're all working towards the same goal, then it becomes less of, I'm not gonna take your change because it might break my uptime. It's more about, let's get this in so we can grow the, the product usage and we'll do it in a way that, that prevents outage so it keeps customers coming back. Okay. It's about, yes, shared incentive, shared responsibility. If, if you are incenting the two sides differently and holding them responsible for different things, then you have a lot, a lot of resistance. If, if dev is incented to deliver on a particular date and has no responsibility for the uptime of what they deliver, yeah, ops is gonna be resistant to that. <laughs> And then you're gonna to remember to actually get your QAs to check it, and then you're gonna be like, oh, maybe, oh, okay, yeah. So that's usually how that goes. Um, we're getting better. I think as, a, as an industry, we are getting better at remembering the three legs of the stool earlier in the process. So are there any other questions right now? Because I, I have one final one. Here, no, go ahead. Okay, yeah. So uh, we're very new in the um, moving to the cloud you know, architecture, we're doing a standard shrink wrap app and uh, CICD seems to be like, you know, the, the pipeline for all the new fixes and everything goes in. Is there a best practices you guys have seen as far as like our traditional apps are based on, you know, RPMs and, you know, we do in-place upgrades or do we destroy your VMs and just you know, if we're not horrible, it's not really scalable yet, but I can imagine where in the future when things are re-architected, you can just kind of like, you know, slough your cattle and bring up new ones with the right stuff, but kind of the older transitioning from kind of the legacy model as they, as companies move to cloud architectures, um, whether you guys have any best practices or have you guys experienced uh, best ways to handle those you know, continual, continuous, continual uh, <laughs> deployment, uh, you, you know, done? kind of challenges. So Mike, did you want to take that one? Sure. I, I, I think I can provide kind of a different perspective on this. I don't know. Maybe I'm taking too much credit. But I come, I come from uh, a background where we have a lot of pets. And we're not they, uh, my use cases weren't interested in getting rid of their pets. Um, but, but CICD, you know, was kind of the... Uh, the standard. That's what we wanted to get to to accelerate development and to have a better customer experience and not incur all the expense of some long release cycle. Right. Um, so where was I getting at with this? I don't know because you so, talked about pets and I got really confused. <laughs> well, well. I, maybe I misunderstood you, but I feel like a lot of people are coming from this. They have tons of pets. They understand that okay, maybe pets aren't the greatest, we need to move to cattle, but, but there's this transition phase, right? Um, so what we did in kind of this transitive phase is uh, we, we actually did deploy with RPMs, and I would say we were like full, any changes that got merged into our dev branch um, were, were in everybody's development environments, you know, that second. That got deployed continuously. 
<laughs> so that, that was kind of a different packaging uh, and a distribution method than what we had for our production environments. For that, we were like, it, it was more of like of a deployment problem and, and you know, we didn't, we didn't want to hurt people's pets. We wanted to package it up very nicely. We wanted to make sure that all the distro uh, rules were followed. Um, and then we would roll that out in, in a slow fashion, you know, whatever, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, up to our full environment until we felt really confident. And I, I, like, of course, some of that is gonna hold you back, but I feel like that's what worked uh, for us and our customers. So I have to cut the conversation short because we are at time. Um, I do encourage you to stay behind if you have other questions and you want to continue talking with us. Reach out to us um, on email or Twitter as well. Um, and also find us around. We'll be here for the rest of the week. And um, thank you very much to my panelists, my special guests. And thank you all for coming and um, being part of the conversation. Thank you.